Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is J.R. Lott, and I'm the executive director of the Hampton Community Development Corporation, which also oversees the Hampton University Business Incubator. And on behalf of our president, Dr. William R. Harvey, we certainly do want to welcome you to Hampton University uh, because this is a program that's co-sponsored with the city of Hampton and Hampton University in an effort to help you as small business owners and entrepreneurs. And just to tell you a little bit about our facility, this facility was started in 1999. Uh, we received a grant from the United States Department of Commerce uh, to build this facility to help entrepreneurs in the area, uh, help create jobs so that we could also help families in the area, and provide a, a training forum so that entrepreneurs can not only just start businesses, but they can start businesses for a long-term viability. Because many of you know, small businesses, they actually have a very, very low success rate. Yet 80% of all small businesses fail in the first three to five years. And there's some very common reasons for that when you really start looking at why some businesses went out of business. And while most entrepreneurs and small business owners, the reason they go into business is because they're very passionate. Uh, they may have some experience in a particular field that they want to expand their knowledge base. But oftentimes, those entrepreneurs who do fail, they fail because while they had all that passion and experience to start their business, they really didn't have the knowledge base to operate the business. And they didn't have the business skills that is really essential in keeping the business going on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. And I've often thought, and I'm, I'm really talking to somebody about maybe initiating a study of just how much money is lost from people who start businesses. It has to be a tremendous amount. <laughs> because most people either start businesses from their savings, and now what's common is their 401k. They, they take a loan out from, from financial institutions and they default on the loan because the business can't sustain itself or they borrow money from friends and relatives. But when you really think about it, if 80% of those businesses are failing and that initial investment oftentimes is in the, in the thousands of dollars, that's a lot of money. It's just going down the drain. So what we try to do here at the incubator is that we have a program as an entrepreneur that you can come into our program and you can stay in our program for up to 36 months. And the value of that is that now you have a base of help because we help mentor you. We provide workshops such as this workshop uh, today. Uh, we partner with other organizations in the community. And we try to give you a template so that you can build that knowledge base for your long-term success. In addition to that, what I think is a valuable component of the program is that now you're here within this facility on a day-to-day -day basis because this becomes your corporate address. And this is where you operate out of on a daily basis. And so just that, that camaraderie and being involved with people who are all going in the same direction really is a tremendous asset to have. Because one business owner may have a problem and you just might bounce that idea off of somebody else who said, well, yeah, yeah, I have a problem getting past the gatekeeper in companies. You know, how do you do that? <laughs> you all are familiar with that. Huh? And so that's really the value of being here in the incubated program. So I just want to give you a uh, little history about how we got started and what we do here on a day-to-day -day basis. But one question I always try to ask in these workshops, how many of you are here for your first time? Raise your hand. Over half of you. So which tells me that we still have a marketing job to do to expose entrepreneurs like yourselves about the, the services uh, that we offer you to help you as a business owner. But we try to have these lunch and learns on a monthly basis. And while they're mandatory for our incubator clients to attend, we do open them up 
to you, the public, to be a part of these so that you can get the knowledge and skills to help advance your business. So with that, I want to introduce to you one of our partners that's uh, co-sponsoring this event, uh, the Urban League of Hampton Roads. We've worked with them over the years uh, to try to provide these types of forums to help small businesses. And we have in our presence today the President and CEO, Ms. Edith White. So let's give her a big hand. Well, thank you, Mr. Locke. It's always a pleasure to partner with the Hampton University Business Incubator. The Urban League of Hampton Roads is also in the business of helping uh, businesses to succeed. We know that small businesses are the lifeblood of this economy. Mm -hmm. And when we look around at all that has happened over the last few years, we know that it is imperative that more support be provided. And so we take a proactive approach as well, trying to provide the information on the front end, as well as the wraparound services and resources so that we can produce more successful small businesses in Hampton Roads. The Urban League is a regional organization, part of a national brand that's been in existence for more than 100 years. But here in Hampton Roads, we <coughs> operate from a headquarters in Virginia Beach and satellite offices in Hampton, Norfolk, as well as Portsmouth. What I mean by wraparound services for small businesses is that we provide programs in education, health, housing, workforce development, as well as advocacy around issues dealing with equality and justice in our community. And so I'm not going to be before you long because we have some experts here who will talk to you. And I think today's session is so important because this is about the transfer of knowledge. These individuals have the expertise, have the business success to transfer to those who are trying to incorporate uh, that information into their own businesses. And so with that being said, I invite you to a productive uh, hour and a half or so of information, but please utilize the resources in this room and all of you are resources <laughs> to help our region become stronger and better. And just as a side note, I know I was going to sit down, <laughs> but I remembered another resource that the Urban League offers, and that is every week we host a radio show called Building a Better Life here on um, the Hampton University campus that we make available to small businesses and others in the community who are looking to promote their products and services. And so if you are interested in that type of assistance, please see me or contact the Urban League at any time. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> to help us bring to you this panel discussion, we have a, a very excellent moderator who I am uh, just, I admire a great deal. She has a lot of passion as a small business owner herself. So without any further ado, let's give Ms. Valerie Jennings. Thank you so much, JR, and to all of you who introduce yourselves, it's just such a wealth of information and experience in the room and I want to acknowledge that. So the first question is why did you decide to become an entrepreneur? At a crossroads I was probably about 15. So back in Louisiana me and the youngest of 14 children. I was either going to become a Roman Catholic priest but I thought about it so, you know as a high achiever I wanted to become the Pope. Wow. There's only one pope, yes. so my <laughs> chances of succeeding is that was pretty tough. That's an ultimate period, isn't it? <laughs> true, true. So, so secondary to that, our father was a hard worker, and then our mother as well. You know, we always say, that, you know, Mark and myself and my other brother and my siblings, if that woman doesn't make it to heaven, none of us have a chance. I can tell you. Four, she had a, 14 kids in a span of 18 years. I'm just glad they didn't stop at 13. <laughs> but, Basically, uh, you know, our father really had a dream. He was, he was always an entrepreneur, worked two jobs his whole life, hard working man. And he taught us to trade from little boys up. And uh, I just knew as a young kid, I wanted to own my own enterprise and make my parents proud. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's ask the same question, uh, Dory, because you also started at an early age at 16. And yes. so why did you decide to become an entrepreneur? I grew up in Pennsylvania Mountains, way back when you could be a nurse, a teacher, yeah. or stay-at-home mom. And yes. none of those things fit. So because we were, I lived in the mountains, we were a very poor 
uh, came from a very poor family, uh, everybody had to chip in. And, and I wasn't real good at the uh, babysitting type stuff. We didn't like kids. <laughs> <laughs> and something with the blood and patching them up didn't work for me. So, and it wasn't profitable. So I thought, you know, I've always liked, I've always been motivated. So I, I uh, went into the shoe factory and I looked around and I was amazed just to see things being able to be put together, taken from this stage to that stage and then come out at the end. And I was just very impressed with it. And so I lied about my age and I said I was 18. <laughs> and so that, because you had to be 18 to be able to be part of it. And so I told them I was 18, and back then they didn't card you, they didn't <laughs> You showed up, you were good. <laughs> so I um, went in to as a sewing machine operator in the shoe factory. And just the camaraderie of the people that, that yes. you get to know. I mean, back in those days, it was, you were, it was piecework, and that was a very cutthroat thing. And you were not accepted easily because you were that young thing coming in that's going to raise the rates and cut the, the per case and make it harder for all of us. So you had to kind of work around that type thing and, and build a, a small community within a community. Yes. And then when I uh, met my uh, high school sweetheart that turned out not to be so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> not a textile area and that was all I knew yeah so I, I was going around I had gone, gone to the unemployment office you know two or three times and they wanted to have me make beds well I wasn't good at that either I could make a bed but I wasn't real good at living of it and then I tried waitress and the customer's not always right I don't care how you put it <laughs> and so I mean it was an interesting transition and after I'd been here about six months I kept going back and I don't know whether they got stamped tired of seeing me or they just found me something because here she comes again you know that didn't work out come on back so uh, they the Bistrops, Mr. and Mrs. Bistrop had owned U.S. Flag and Signal, and I had the background that they were looking for an experienced operator. So I was uh, sent down there, had an appointment set up. Well, I was this little mountain girl, and we had 220 went this way and this way, and I had only gotten off this way, so I got back up, and I was on my way to Richmond. I was halfway to Richmond before I realized, I don't want to do this every day. <laughs> so I, you know, I went back home and I called Mr. Bistrop and I explained to him, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity and I really would have loved, I think I would have fit in, but, you know, I'm halfway to Richmond and that's really longer than I want to drive every day. And he went, which way did you go? I said, same way I got off, you know, because that was as far as I got, fourth and Ocean View. And he said, no, you need to go to the next exit. He said, let's set this up for tomorrow, okay? And so I went down and I interviewed with Mr. Bistrop and I got the job. The rest is history, but, as they say. Yes, but he, we worked a, long, a lot of years together. Uh, him and his wife owned a business. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1990. And at that point in time, they had three daughters that weren't interested in the company. And so they had approached me, because by then, of course, he had been ill with cancer and she was having to take care of him. So I was running the day-to-day -day business. Very nice. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'd like to do, uh, Jack, is begin to shift into, for you, you were in the military, you transitioned to consulting, and you had your own business, you're chief executive officer, a wonderful ongoing concern, and I'd like for you to identify three do's and don'ts that you would share with this group about being an entrepreneur. Okay, before I do that, let yes. me just tell you briefly sure. about my journey okay. and how I Fair got enough. here. Uh, I had a marvelous military career. I did a lot of different things. And at retirement, I found that I was marketable to a lot of different companies in a lot of different spaces. So I said, maybe there's a way for me to work for all of these people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I went over to what was then the Price Club, and it's now Costco. And I bought a notebook on how to start your own business. Now, to date me, it had a floppy disk in there. <laughs> so I incorporated a consulting practice. I went back to the individuals I had, uh, had uh, sought jobs with and says, I can't work for you full time, let me work for you part time. And that's how I really started. I did the incorporation. Uh, I launched the business over my garage, and I was an international consultant 
maybe four or five years. I expanded the consulting business, and then I moved to where we, where we are now. Yes. One of the lessons I've learned is that you have to make the transition from the I company to the we company. When you really start, you do everything yourself, okay? And you really have to learn to hire good people, work with good people, empower them, and get off and do that. So that's the one big question I have. The other one is, and there are some banking friends in here, is to treat your banker like your very best customer, okay? Make sure early on that the banker understands the kind of business you're in and what you're doing, what you need, because inevitably you're gonna go back and you're gonna need that. You need to be responsive and, and you really have to do that. Uh, the final piece is that uh, you have to kind of learn to, if you're a small business person, mow your lawn twice a week. I'll tell you what that means. When I was first in the military and back in the 60s and we integrated neighborhoods, the tendency was to believe that if you were a minority, the property values were gonna go down, okay? So I made a habit of mowing my lawn twice a week instead of once a week, okay? And I've done that as a business person throughout. You've gotta do a little bit more to get that right, and that's kind of Thank you, and thank you for providing the, the backdrop of your transition to what you're doing now, uh, that whole idea of mowing the lawn, because with a background in diversity and inclusion, and given the mission of what this whole incubator is about, uh, there are things that come up for us as women, or as people of color, or uh, anyone navigating in, in the water. So, so thank you for, for putting that on the board. Tell me this. Um, for others, and you can you can add in your do's and don'ts as we go through this. Describe also how do you handle failure? How, did, how does how does that get taken into consideration? Where do we go with that? Describe how you handle failure. Do okay. Um, there's a, a rap song that's out that says, uh, "What hurts you doesn't kill you, makes you stronger." Or, mm -hmm. So. Basically, failure you should you should really build off of. It. I mean, as a small business person, you should be motivated. When someone tells you no, you gotta have that inside drive to continue to move forward. And I'm gonna say in several ways, failure helps you build the three C's. And you know, for me in business, you've got character, capacity, and capital, and they're intricate. For this one reason. Character, you do what you say you're gonna do, because if you do not do that, you will continue to fail. Yeah. And even if you do things that are wrong, you gotta correct them. That's a part of having a character. You gotta be truthful, treat people the way you expect to be treated. That's right. And that's gonna open a lot of doors for you. It may take you 10 times, give you a small example. We were just an 8A contractor. It took me three years to get my first project. Three years. I knocked on so many doors. Mm -hmm. I mean, my knuckles were actually there. Mm -hmm. But we had the advantage of doing other work between there. So, I mean, first time I ever made a presentation to a, you know, contracting officer. So I go to the lady, I said, hey, we're fresh 8A. I've got bonding capacity. I've been in business 25 years. I bought this company. And she says, uh, it's all fine and dandy, but do an 8A job first. Then I'm gonna give you an 8A job. So I left there scratching. I said, how are you ever gonna get a job at this point? But we persevered and, and failure is not always a bad thing. Some of the best jobs I've ever lost have been a blessing from on high. That's ones that I mean would have taken us out of here. The capital side of it, when you make money, put it back in your company. Absolutely. You gotta do that. You have to do that. And when you grow your company stronger with the capital base, you can do more things between there. Then the capacity. Have the capacity at the right time to grow. And failure helps you with that as well. Because it gives you a diff different perspective on how you should you know, move your business life and your personal life from that standpoint as well. You know, Bill Gates yes. says that every year he would hire someone who failed. Because through failure, you learn 
Right. So right. just try not to make the same mistakes the second time. Right. Mm -hmm. But that was what he always did. Exactly. Exactly. When you were talking about starting your business and you were over the garage, I thought of Bill Gates. So. Yeah. And John is absolutely right about preserving your capital. You need to be an opportunistic company because in this environment, you really need access to that to grow. Throughout the life of my company, I've always reinvested my profits. That's my standard. So when the opportunity comes along to capitalize on something new, I say, we'll do it. The, this next question is, when is it a good time to start a business? Mm -hmm. Uh, and Dory, I know your transition in was a little different. You became one of the family. Uh, if you'd like to comment on that, or John or Jack would like to comment on when's a good time to start a business based on what you've seen or heard or... You can't go by the economy. You can't go by... Um, you have to have a passion for it. There has to be a need. You have to do your, your research. Um, you have to have your capital lined up. There's so many things you have to do prior to. There's a difference between planning it and then launching it. Uh, a vast difference. So many people that start businesses and become entrepreneurs have the vision and the passion. They're still employed by one person while they're put, putting the pieces together to be able to launch that business. And that's, I, I don't know that there's a time frame for that. I, I really don't. Jack, what do you think? For me, I say it's never too late. Mm -hmm. I was 40 years old when I started my company. What you do not want to do is be sitting in a rocking chair wishing you tried it. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Right. Do your own work, but mm -hmm. it's not too late to do it. So true. Then half the battle is, I mean, the good Lord lets us wake up in it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. <laughs> That's half the battle. Maybe we'll take it and move it forward. But, you know, Dory's exactly right. You've got to have a drive and passion. If you don't have a drive and passion, you're not going to be successful, right? Exactly. And tell me this, um, and for the audience, do you need a large nest egg to start a business? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I would say this. It, I mean, it does help from a standpoint of having some, some uh, you know, capital behind you and being able to move things forward. However, your best capital is yourself. You can really do a lot more things. I mean, money does help. I mean, right. that's, that's a big situation. I just know coming from humble beginnings, you actually have an advantage. You don't need much, actually. I yeah. mean, just, uh, finally, you know, if you're Silver Spoon and your daddy is you know, multimillionaire or whatever, it's much more easier. You're probably going to give him things. Nine times out of ten, that person is not going to be successful because he or she probably would not have earned it. Just need to learn to be creative, too. Yeah. I was a Fred Sanford. Okay, for those of you who know this, <laughs> when I opened my corporate offices and I needed to furnish those offices, I found a place up in Northern Virginia that refurbished office furniture. They would buy furniture from government agencies, from banks, at a high-end place, and they'd go in and they would refinish it. So I walked in there one day and I was looking for some desks and a few other things. This guy was sitting there, and I said, do you have this? And he says, I have no idea what I have. I said, why don't you know what you have? And he pulled out this piece of paper, and he started looking. He says, I don't have a list. And I said, why don't you have it on a computer? And he says, well, the old man doesn't really like computers. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy you a laptop. I'll create a spreadsheet for you if you will give me deep discounts on furniture. And that's how I did it. So be creative, you know, use whatever resources you have. Yes, yes exactly. And that rolls us nicely into this next question, and we've already touched on it um, some. What are some of the primary characteristics one should have as a business owner? We've talked about drive and passion and being creative. Are there other things that come to mind that uh, allow us to know that someone can be successful if they have these particular characteristics? I mean, I've touched on it a little bit. I mean, being, being truthful, being trustworthy, and doing what you say you're going to do. You know, we live in an era now where everything is instantaneous, right? And it appears, if you look on the television, you got all these, um, what do you call these shows? Yeah, you know, reality. These, yeah, reality shows. You see the dysfunctionality, and people feed on that, right? So, basically, I mean, if you're, if you're true and honest and trustworthy, 
and you treat people in a fair, dignified way, nine times out of ten you're going to win. You will have failures, like you said, but it, you know, overall, I just firmly believe we, we try to treat people, and we aren't perfect, not any stretch of imagination, but we try to do things the right way. We don't always succeed. We just you know, we back up and punt and redo it again. I absolutely agree with that, a character and ethics. The other thing I would say to you is that be prepared to give back. All of us right. are blessed, okay? okay? And give of your time and your effort, not just your money. There's a lot of pain in the society, mm -hmm. and that's part of what I think makes a good business owner. Yes, sir. And tell us this, how do you get comfortable with being uncomfortable? <laughs> you smile a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't th are we ever in our comfort zones because we're always looking to expand, to build, and go forward. I mean, you, you've got to have a vision to look ahead. You can't get so comfortable today. I think I spoke to a couple of people this morning and I said, you know, my thing in marketing is, is uh, you need to market when you don't need business. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the things, one of the mistakes I had made back in the early 90s. We were 95% uh, of government contractor. That's all we did. Well, then they stopped big contracts. There was some of the contracts that were your bread and butter. You know, and if you had those, everything else was kind of cream on the, on the top. But we didn't market because we didn't have to. We, had, we were very comfortable doing what we did. We were very good at what we did. And, and we had built... Uh, we didn't diversify. We didn't have the commercial market we have today. We were strictly government. We didn't do the individuals. And so that was a hard lesson learned. I mean, you had to cut your staff down, which, which is really hard. And you're going, uh, and we should have market, and we should have branched out. And now we have dealerships. We have 36 dealerships throughout the United States. We, we're going into exporting. But we were so comfortable at that level that an arrogant, Come on, we're the only you in town, you're going to get better. You know, don't get that. Don't get that. Because there's always somebody that's coming up behind you, always somebody has new ideas. You know, my advice would say, would be, uh, don't hit the comfort zone where, where you think, nope, you're on the top, because there's nowhere to dance. Absolutely. You have to be able to assess risk. My good friend John here is very, very good at that. And I always say, you will never steal second base if you keep your foot on first. No, very, very true. I mean, it's, it's, it's really good to get out of your comfort zone and do things that you otherwise would not do because it forces you. Your left hand side is telling you not to do it. Your right hand side says, do it. You, yep. you really have to because it broadens your horizons and it gives you the, the opportunity. I mean, like us, we've. We're vested in probably 15 to 20 different entities. And our dad was very smart. He said, son, do not ever put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> Make sure you spread them around because, lo and behold, you know, one egg is going to be better than the other. Exactly. What action did you take to move your company? So when you were going from hundreds to thousands and from thousands to millions, what was it that you were doing? What allowed you to be able to make those jobs? For me, it was infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's making sure that, uh, first of all, that you have solid financials, OK? You know, you might not always be that profitable, but the bankers will tell you the integrity of your numbers of what counts, OK? And they're your best friend. But yeah. You're your best friend. Yes. So you do that. And it's really pretty difficult sometimes to balance that but finance is human resources, the infrastructure you need to have in place so that you can perform. Because you don't get a lot of second chances sometimes as a small business. You know? Lots of big businesses, you can fail and you come back, but the tendency is if you really blow it, you might not come back. So mm -hmm. infrastructure is very, very important. I agree. It's also true, John. I mean, that makes a huge, huge difference. Also, people, you got to be able to develop your people because you can't always be there. I mean, I remember when we first started, you know, I bought Bay Electric. I did everything. I did the billing <laughs> because I didn't trust anyone <laughs> that would get the bills on the door. And, the, and then over time, we at the high, we had 248 people. Mm -hmm. Not that I ever want to get that big again. We've actually downsized a little bit, but we're trusting people. And when you get to that point, you got to develop people. Mm -hmm. 
they're going to make mistakes and it's going to irritate you a little bit. However, knowing from that point, they're going to learn from that and, and make you a better company yeah. overall. I believe I saw in one of the articles uh, written about you that you call it people power. People power that you, in fact, you do gas and you're environmentally strong and people power is one of the ways you generate that. Yes, ma'am. Very yeah. true. Exactly. If you had it to do all over again, what would you do differently? <laughs> you know, for me, it's been sort of a dream ride. I mean, you, you know, one of the great advantages we have, we live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. I've had a chance to travel abroad, and uh, we can do things here that you couldn't dream about doing anywhere else. Take, for instance, this morning, newspaper. You're looking at, um, a ravaging civil war in Egypt, mm -hmm. and it's only getting worse. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're placed in a steady environment here that you can be successful. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do something, you can. This is one of the few countries on earth that you can do that in. Mm -hmm. And I just think we're just blessed to be able to have this opportunity to be here. But it's up to the individual to seize that moment, because everyone in here can be a Bill Gates. Right. If you want to, I mean, I live by the motto, you're never going to take any wealth that you develop. You're never going to take it with you. That's right. That's right. That's right. So while you're here, you should try to help and do other things. Right. Mm -hmm. with that. I might have shifted in my business a little bit sooner than I did. I started out in the professional services business. And the landscape in the professional services for government contractors is really pretty, pretty daunting right now. Uh, it's very, very competitive. Uh, and I decided that I needed to diversify. And I started a manufacturing operation. Now, my business school professors would probably beat me up by saying, you usually stay in your lane. If you're services, you don't move over to some other place. But I found the right people, and I launched that, and this turned out to be really, really great. I probably would have moved a little bit quicker in diversification than I did. How have technology and, <clears throat> and social media played a role in your company's evolvement? It's a big portion for a small business, the technology, because it puts you out there. I have met and have gained customers from Europe, uh, from California. I mean, there's no way that you can market your business worldwide without technology. There's just not a way to do that. I mean, uh, the social media now, I, I can't pretend, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I do all that because i got people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting here. Seriously, I mean, he's absolutely right. I, it takes one person or a staff to be able to keep up with that because there's so much to learn and there's so, informa so much information to put out there and what's the correct information and what's the timing and what and uh, how is it going to be perceived and there's just all of that. And, and I learned that we're working on, because we were going to move into the exporting business, that uh, the website you would think would hear, that you have here at home, the colors on that may be offensive for, for another nation. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so many different things that you yourself cannot do that. You need your people, you, you really do. It's huge. Uh, we launched a commercial software product, and traditionally we would have been out marketing and selling it and all over the place. Yesterday, we did a webinar okay, where we were able to attract individuals from different countries and different places to see our product. And we did that on the web. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. So, yeah. Well, bidding and estimating work and doing development work, I mean, just in an equity trade alone is over 2 million points. So we figured, and we used to bid work longhand. So we had the ledger sheet and you'd write all this stuff down. And then the fax machines came and made it a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Y'all still have a <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> and those papers you That's put right. up on your um, That's right. on your dashboard, mm -hmm. and you come back out and they're all black. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, oh no! Right. <laughs> well, closing it. I mean, everyone in here, just with a laptop, you can fortune five hundred company. They don't have anything different. Yeah. Well, they probably have a little more scale and different things, but actually, you you have the ability, you know, individually to do a lot of things with your own laptop computer. It's it's huge. So it's a game changer. I mean, for us, we do a lot of work, and uh, you know, we demand a lot of our people though, too to make sure that folks are doing what they're supposed to do. And it's a big, you know, technology has helped us do a lot more. Yes. 
and it's constantly changing. The cloud yes. is revolutionizing yes. everything. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Tell us this, what is your strategy in getting new customers? <laughs> what we're doing right now is we are uh, behind the initiative Made in America. If you want the best, it's right here. You don't have to go offshore with it. So we're doing a campaign with that, and we're, and we're doing uh, we have uh, we're doing new brochures. We're putting on our website. We're actually letting them come into the plant and, and take pictures and things like that. We got an opportunity with uh, CBS where they were doing. I think they were over here in Hampton as well, where they were filming that uh, movie here, and so they needed. It was, uh, it's supposed to be aired in September, so we allowed them to come into the plant. And actually, if you have never seen a movie shot and you ever get the opportunity, do it. Mm -hmm. Because they had to come in, Colleen, and they, uh, we had got to meet Taylor Hackworth, and he's done, he's, he's a famous uh, producer, and he had, he's done Ray, and he did Officer and a Gentleman. So he came in, and he, he was an amazing man, just absolutely amazing. And he came in, and he said, now we don't want to be disrupted. Now, I only got 25,000 square foot. You know, and we got plants and we got warehouses and all this. And he said, he said, so we want people to work. So he said, everybody that wants to be part of this, he said, you know, they had to sign a contract allowing them to do that. And so the next thing you know, they have rails down the side or across the plant. And they have a cameraman and he's, there's no way you were going to produce anything that day. You just, <laughs> want, I mean, and, you, know, they, you move too fast, you're trying to get the sound, and you couldn't run the machines, and I mean, it was absolutely amazing. But, you know, it's just opportunities mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. so. That's an amazing opportunity. It was. So it's airing really in September so we can. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll email um, JR and okay. let him know. But it was funny Excellent. because uh, some of the employees were part of it, and then they brought, some of them didn't want to be. And so we said, okay, why don't you stand aside? We'll pay you. It's an opportunity to watch this. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, who's going to run our machines? Because, you know, they're very territorial sometimes. <laughs> and I said, oh, they got a whole room full of folks over there. Yeah. <laughs> and so they were just sitting there, and we just took the thread out, and they were running them, and, you know, and stuff like that. But it was so funny. But they got insulted. Because, but then uh, it's a different world. It is. It's a different world. They're walking through the plant. I've got, like, we do the high-end flags, the agencies in, in one department, and they're walking through there drinking coffee, and I'm going, that's a thousand dollar flag. <laughs> 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 How are we going to know here? You know, so I said, you know, uh, let's switch some things out, you know, because they don't stop for a lunch break like you do, and, and they don't take their, their on the run all the time. But it, it was a, it's a wonderful experience. It was a great opportunity. But I mean, it has helped move us. You know, we got the notoriety that we ordinarily wouldn't have gotten. And it was funny because Taylor said, Dory, you want to be in this? And I went, no, I'm too old for this mess. I am not going to do this. I know how many wrinkles I got, thank you very much. And he said, no, no, come on, you ought to do this. And I said, look, I talked to your extras. I know what you pay. I don't got a bit for that kind of money. <laughs> 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 I'm going back and I'm not It was a great opportunity. But you never know what opportunity is going to knock. Right. Be open. Right. You know, Absolutely. you may think this is this is a waste of my time, but it may be the opportunity of a lifetime. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. We've expanded internationally. What we have, we have a product line where we manufacture kind of like laser tag, if you've ever seen it. We do it for <laughs> our ground military forces for our army because, the, the, you know, we have our troops coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, and they've got to be busy and have to train. So that was the line of business we started. What we found is our allies like to do the same thing we do and buy the same thing we do. So we have a contract in our media where we're, where we're manufacturing and we have other places we're doing. So you've got to expand. One good way also is taking care of the existing customer. Mm -hmm. If you take yeah. care of that customer, just by virtue of doing that, you're going to get references and other things. And that's something we try to drive home. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, John, you touched on this early on. This question is, describe your humble beginnings and how that has been a factor in your company's success today. You know, my brothers would probably not agree with this more. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, being the, 
being the youngest when I came home from the hospital, mom said she didn't see me for six years because my <laughs> oldest sister is, you know, I guess I was a play toy or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, raised me in you know, that time you grew. But, you know, basically with that, um, you know, just, just, just growing and just developing from that piece. But basically, I was a baseball player. I had a dream I was going to make it to the big leagues. Mm -hmm. I was a decent baseball player. Dad, you know, I guess that was kind of his retirement card. He allowed me to do that while the other <laughs> brothers worked a little bit more. I still work, though. I crawled under my share of houses and, <laughs> and whatnot. But, you know, you know, humility is a good thing. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, never take yourself that serious here. I want to hear for a finite amount of time, so mm -hmm. exactly. yeah. we're going to live well. <laughs> and what strategies will your company consider for future growth? I mean, I can answer that now. We, we actually are actively probably going to purchase a firm out of South Dakota. Mm -hmm. One would question, why would you go to South Dakota? <laughs> the Bach and All Shell one of the largest deposits of oil and natural gas we have in the United States. And there's a place called Williston, North Dakota. If you want to start a business there, it is incredible, the opportunities. Be aware, though, it gets negative 40, two, three months out of the year, but it gets pretty cold. But, you know, we're expanding in that horizon. In Louisiana, where we're born and raised, there's a natural gas expansion going on like you've never seen. So we're liquefying natural gas then we're gonna ship it to Europe and Asia and other places. Right out of the city, I grew up in Electro, so we, so we set up shop there and we're gonna hire some people and send some trusted you know, soldiers from here to run it. We'll incentivize them, you know, give them some equity stake and give them a chance to make some money as well, you know, live the American dream. So, so we're gonna you know, grow organically as well as, you know, with theirs, you know, Jack mentioned earlier, opportunistic. When you reinvest in your company, you have the capital to go out and purchase someone Think about the baby boomers. There's a lot of people that are retired. They're gonna sell their companies. They have a client base that's built up already. They don't want a whole lot of money because they're probably a little old. They don't, you know. So huge opportunities, I think, right now. Acquisition is certainly a way to do it. During our lifespan, we have a, we acquired a space launch country, company. Uh, I recently bought the worldwide rights to uh, state-of-the-art technology, radio RF, uh, but acquisition to Jack is being humble, and I've had a chance to see his operation in Florida. It's incredible. I mean, the, the company he's purchased there, I wouldn't be surprised if Miss Zell would be in New York here soon. Because it's incredible. Huge opportunity. And that was about people. Five individuals who've been in this business space for over 100 years wanted to start something again. They wanted to get back together. They came knocking on my door, and I liked what I saw. And within a week, I had an offer letter, and it just kicked them off. That was about uh, 15 months ago. We've got 60 employees, uh, 25,000 square feet of manufacturing space. Hopefully double it by the end of the year. They've won about $70 million in contracts. But it was the right time and able to just highlighted that there's a humility mm -hmm. along with all of this. Oh, by the yeah. way, I, I, yes. I grew up on a farm in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here because I didn't want to pick cotton in it. <laughs> 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 the first in the family to go to college. No, oh, I didn't want to do that. So you <laughs> learned. <laughs> all the stuff we well, want to do. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to pick sure. cotton. <laughs> Business plans. How would you describe the role of a business plan, even if your company started without one? Essential. Essential. Absolutely essential. essential. You have got to. It's. It's really an outline of where you want to go, but it's got to be flexible enough to change and grow with where you're going. You would like to sit down and you know, I've done all my research and I've got all my plans and this is what I'm going to do, and, but then when you. And, and build your support system there as well. Don't surround yourself with somebody saying, you know, that's a good idea. Why are you not thinking? You need, some, you need the opposition. You need the input because you can't think of everything. But it is essential. I don't even think you can get a business loan anymore without a business plan, can you? I'm not even SBA, and you know, there's so many opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's essential for success. You have to have it. 
and the key elements in there, assessing your competition, making sure you have a good plan. Those are all crucial things you have to do. And that plan is going to change as well. Oh, it's going to change. Every level, at every level of step, you're going to tweak it up. Mark and Clay back there, it's a constant evolution. We're going through another change from being huge back down to a manageable size because we don't want to. It's a lot when you do it. A lot of work, I mean, especially in the construction. It's, it's, it's very uh, very risky. I mean, yes. One of the only you know, businesses that one job can take you out of here. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Mm -hmm. And that's what was said earlier on was that you were very good at assessing risk and that, that is one of the keys. So before we open this up for questions, uh, what final comments or recommendations do you have for us? I would say surround yourself with people that share your vision, that can help you get where you want to go. Every opportunity to meet somebody is a networking opportunity. Every, every, uh, be part of your chamber of commerce, uh, be active in your home city. We uh, recently were approached by the city of Portsmouth for the uh, Hampton uh, Economic Development, and they have a program, Economic gardening and they're helping us reach out and doing a lot of research it would be extremely expensive and that we wouldn't have the time to do ourselves into different areas uh, across the United States uh, where the bases are we're trying to get set up new dealerships is where we're planning on going but a lot of times it was by uh, trial and error is how we got there before was somebody would uh, we sold to the military they would take it to an out you know, that would go to a base and somebody would need another one, so they'd take it to their local little flag store, and we had our name in it, and that's how we developed, because they had a need, and we could offer them something. They didn't have to invent a lot, or invest in a lot of inventory, so that's how we grew and set up that way, but this will be a more structured plan to help us get where we want to be. So there's opportunity in your own home cities. There's so much free training that's offered, and all it is, and I know your time is your most valuable commodity, so you, I mean, you have to invest it well, but the training you get is essential to your success, and a lot of it is free. <coughs> well, I mean, we live by the motto, you're only as good as the last project you've completed. I mean, you can rack up 100 attaboys and just have one bad project, <laughs> and all of a sudden, boy, you used to be a good company, man. They're horrible now. <laughs> <laughs> Those things happen, but yeah, you know, live by that motto, and, Large is not, you know, necessarily better. Right. Ten million dollars. I mean, I, you know, we we did much better as a smaller firm uh, from a profitability standpoint than we were humongous, and that that was a lesson learned for us. And uh, you know, along the way, like Jack said earlier, help someone. Right. When you've done something and been successful, help someone along because I think that helps, you know, move you moving in the right direction. And don't get mad at the gatekeepers of these companies, because I've got, I've got different layers. I get so many sales calls from the whole nine Try to pass them off the mark as often as I can. <laughs> John talked earlier about surrounding yourself with good people. People are absolutely crucial. And the old adage of remember how you like to be treated and treat other people that way, that's, that's very, very important recognize that people are different and they're more than just social security numbers that's okay they're human beings with mortgages and kids and all of that so those are the tough decisions that you have to make but don't ever forget that piece of it that's what i'm going to add one more thing sure. don't be afraid to team with your competitors okay. yeah, yeah. Right. if you have a competitor if there's a larger opportunity that you can team with someone yeah. now i will say Get the legal part down because <laughs> it's like a marriage. You will have some issues when you're you know, dealing with another company. But mm -hmm. basically do that. But go go in eyes wide open. You can be you know, much more successful because a little piece of the pie is better than no pie at all. Yes. Yes. Could you all touch on what opportunities you all see coming, how you evaluate those opportunities, and assemble your resources, both capital and human, to execute take advantage of those opportunities that, uh, that y'all see coming. Um, we're on the uh, PTAC program, and what they do is, is it, again, embraces technology, and you have your, 
your keywords and your cage codes and, and your uh, mix codes. And a lot of that, you get a forecast of what's coming up for bid. And you bid it. It's hard to plan in this economy because you will bid and your bid may be out there for 90 days plus two years. You don't know. And they'll come back periodically. You never know when they're going to award it or when they're going to fund it. So that makes it difficult for planning that. Uh, you, I would say anybody in our position, you have to have a credit line. And you want to not use that money because that's when you may need it, when you have to do samplings or buy inventory or, or something like that. That is like your, your nest egg. But uh, you have to make some opportunities. You have to go out and say, hey, we're here. Uh, I've done a lot of cold calls. I happen to be uh, in Texas last year and I just rented a car and, and I went in to local chamber of commerce because I had a few, you know, a couple of days layover because I was heading somewhere else and I just pulled out the, the yellow pages and I called and, and introduced myself and cold call is a very hard thing to do but it teaches you something. It truly does. It teaches you. You have to focus in on what, you know, I as a manufacturer can bring to you as a retailer. I'm not after your business. I'm not going to service your business. It, it makes you come up with a, with a different approach of what you can bring to the table. But something like that, like I went in and to this one gentleman and I was, I had a Tom Tom and I was going up and down the street and there was no sign for this business. None. But it was listed. I called the chamber. Yeah, they're a viable business. You're just down there. And, and so I was going up and down. So I seen a UPS man and I said, look, I'm looking for flags and stuff here. Can you help me? He said, oh, they're right there. He's on here to pick up. He, they owned a whole shopping center. Mm -hmm. He was a, a um, internet business. He didn't have an office. He didn't have manufacturing. He just bought from everybody and just sold online. And that UPS truck was there to pick up. He filled a truck up every day. So, you know, when you go in, I said, you know, told him who I was. And he said, well, I buy a lot of offshore. I said, well, then you're not getting the best. <laughs> you, if you're selling a U.S. flag, you ought to be having one made in America. So, you know, I said, at least let me talk to you. I said, I drove all the way down here. At least let me give you my spiel. He is one of my biggest dealers. Wow. So, you know, it does happen. And it's not easy because I'm going, you know, when you first went in, and like you said, the gatekeepers aren't real. You know, I said, well, yeah, if you could just give me two minutes, get in my car, you know, we'd be happy to partner if we could work together. If not, you know, I appreciate the time. So, you know. You can do it. It does happen. You have to define yourself. Don't let anyone else define you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do y'all have any insight where we can find the funding for just the purchase orders? All we need, I don't need a long haul, but just wonder when I see one I can win, I contact this institution, they fund the purchase order, give them, the, get the product done, they pay me and I pay that off in 20, 30 days, 15 days, whatever, and keep it moving. And one of the parts that we do. I think Jack made a very good point. We have a whole point here with Virginia Company Bank. You know, introduce yourself to Company Bank. Introduce yourself to Company Bank. Don't wait until you absolutely need it. Go right. in and introduce yourself. And you got to sell your vision. You are, sell yourself. Okay. Sell your vision. And, you know, it might be incremental steps. It may start at a thousand and then grows to five. We, we got to be trying to get the. We see some stuff in there, forty, fifty thousand dollars. There you go. We could have got that for thirty. They spent fifty. And it's right. a city and it's, it's the state level money that. We could have gotten the same exact item or, or better for a lot less, in some cases 10, 15, 60 percent less. So explain okay. that to the bankers and tell them, look, your your vision is that you know these larger companies are you know, bidding way up here. Even at a lower number, you're still gonna make a proportion yeah. of you know profit Probably. and grow it up from that piece. Okay. You gotta have the capital. John might you, you mentioned something John might want to comment on, and that's the whole swam minority business A yeah. piece of it. Be very, very careful. Okay. Uh, treat it more as a business development capability rather than a marketing capability. And the difference is that, you know, if someone wants to buy your goods and services, this is a way for them to get to you. Okay. Not necessarily knocking on the door and said, okay, I'm an 8A company, I'm a swan company, you need to buy from me. But it's not my experience because it didn't happen. It's a hunting well, license. Okay. Yes, it's true. Yeah. I agree with that. Okay. But then I do a lot with the Department of Defense. And they have certain criteria at the end of the year. Now, you know, August and September historically are huge. 
and they check off the list. Are you woman owned? Are you small business? Are you ADA? Are you because they're supposed to be hitting these uh, particular goals that have been set for them, and, and that's supposed to be part of their evaluations as as a command. So it does come in. I mean, on our email, we I have a lot of those certifications, but I don't market those. They're there. They just have to be there. There's a lot of DoD. Um, areas that are that they uh, have different uh, seminars and things like that uh, you don't have to necessarily go up and set up a table or a trade show you can attend and a lot of those commands are looking for you know, make sure it's on your business card the back of my business card if i brought the right stack here it is <laughs> i have all these all the information on there so that they have it whenever they need to place those orders in a short amount of time so I would recommend, you know, I'll give you my business card and maybe you want to emulate some of that material because that'll help because, you know, they'll keep your business card, but they'll look at the back and they have all your numbers and, and information. So in some areas it does matter. The data will show, however, if you look both federal and state and local, the numbers have not been met in terms of... Absolutely. Right. It's like 40 to 50 percent of their business is supposed to be in the slam and so on. So. And they keep saying, well, we can't find you. We don't know where you're at. Now they're not. The marketing dollars are gone and we can't do that. We're not having as many outreach programs as we always had before. You know, and that, that's what they're saying that it is. One of the things that, that I preach uh, both on the street and in the classroom is that uh, strategy planning is essential. But beyond strategy planning is the implementation of strategy. And I was wondering if any of you could speak on that. It's varying degrees. I mean, it depends. I know, you know, in the construction realm, it's very difficult to have a strategy when we really have a dysfunctional type of deal. You, you bid for a service, you have a firm fixed price, right? You've got various or sundry people that might have different relationships. And at the end of the day, it's a relationship game, but at the end of the day, the people that you have will effectively push that strategy where you want it to go. It may not be exactly where you want it, you know, you know, each and every time, but if you build your model where your people know what your expectations are in your organization, nine times out of ten, it's you know, you're gonna be successful in that regard. You're gonna you're gonna strike out so it's gonna happen. You need to constantly measure yeah, how you're doing. Right. Now. It's one thing to put the strategy out there and wait two or three years later and find out it's failed. So you've got to constantly look at how am I doing? Am I implementing this? And change it and modify it. What I've seen, we wait far too long sometimes to assess how well we've been doing. Follow through is very important. You're absolutely right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big time. What I do is I employ people so they're, I'm paying them until the invoices are paid. So obviously that output is out there on my end and uh, I'm creative. I'm like, well, we'll, we'll do EFT. You know, and I, I come up with all these options of things to do, but I find a lot of my time making sure they receive the invoice because it gets caught in the queue and they didn't get it. So I have a lot of time making sure they got it, making sure it's one of this person for approval and that person just to get going because I need that cash flow to continue. So any, Jennifer, any tidbits of information there? For us, Jennifer, we, we call. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a recent anomaly. We, we I mean, for how they had a 14-year run where there's no issue. Our receivables came in. At one point, we had our receivables down to 18 days. Which is incredible. It's triple that now, and the situation is, like you said, the I think the younger generation, and I'm not, you know, I've got two young kids. I've got a daughter at ODU, and I've got a South Lawn High School. They think different. So when they're in the workforce, <laughs> so basically we follow up, and and we do it in a respectful way. You want to, you don't want to be overbearing. Alienate them. Tee off your customer. <laughs> Where's my money? <laughs> but you have to you look at it. You, you, have to, you have to recognize with the federal government they don't pay on time. Right. 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 Yes. Go back. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of times we'll take credit card. Build it up to your price. Build it up to your price. Um, and one component of my program, I talk about developing the mindset of becoming a small business owner and entrepreneur. Can you all speak to that? Because I find that a lot of them, even though they have the drive and the passion, they may not have, they, they accompany that with fear. So can you just speak to the type of mindset a small business owner and entrepreneur um, definitely has to have? 
I think the tenets of being an entrepreneur. Fear is the greatest motivator. Yes, absolutely. Fear of failure, fear of not eating, fear of not <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back to That's mom. I have to go back to mom. So, we, I mean, for, for me, that was a great driver. I, I used that fear, especially, I was last in the pot, so. You know, the humble First day, too. We can agree to disagree. Basically, you know, the fear, fear component, I think, is a strength. You know, it can certainly help you, but you know, you can't be fearful to the point where you can't, you know, pull the trigger. Right. 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 I mean, a lot of times you're going to run out of money, then it's game over. I certainly agree with that fear. I think it's so good. And you have to um, realize that that it is a risk, and you have to assess those risks. You know, what are you willing to lay on the line? My husband was a um, government client. He worked for the government 35 years. He never understood that building a new building, this one's good enough. The, you know, why you gotta have this piece of machinery? That one still works. He never had the concept of wanting, yeah, you know, to, to, yeah. And he kept, he never understood. He was always supportive. Don't get me wrong. He thought I was loony sometimes. <laughs> but you know, he said, you know, at one point he said, you're 50 years old and you're building, you're going two million dollars in debt for a building you really don't need. I did need it, but he couldn't share that. So I mean, it was nice to have somebody to bounce that even. There was some interesting bounces sometimes, but there was somebody there to say, hey, have you thought of this? Because it's a reality check, and, and you need that. You need that. How do you know when to expand to different locations and uh, at which locations to pick will it be successful? Well, that's a tough question. You, you, you really need to assess where you are, the competition, competition what's happening in the marketplace. It, and it's kind of a judgmental call. I mean, you're constantly out looking for new opportunities. It's just nothing magic about it. Just constantly be aware where you are. You know, we were a very, very successful company in our first half in the software business, the systems engineering business. And we found that as we got a little bit larger, there were not any set-aside programs necessarily, and the big companies started coming after us, so we weren't that competitive. So that's when we realized we needed to move because it's just a tough space. I agree. A lot of it is timing, a lot of it is opportunity, and, and knowing your competition. Know your competition. Find your niche. Find what, what it is that you're good at that nobody else wants to bother with. When we were expanding U.S. flag, and instead of doing the three thousands or the large contracts, I said, "Let's let's do the custom stuff. Let's try one. Let's let's put our feelers out in the uh, commercial market. You know, uh, Dollar Tree buys flag. You know, we ended up with Bush Gardens. They do one of this and one of that. Well, the larger companies don't have the time or, or are not engineered to do these ones, and they're very profitable. And one company said, "You're a cable scrap." I said, "I laughed all the way to the bank." <laughs> that's, right. that's how you feel about it. You know, I've got 50 employees, they're all living well. I can live like that. But, you know, and it, it's just the way you look at it and find your niche. Find something that you can offer your customer or their customer, okay, that nobody else can. And you, we are a privately held company, and we can make our own decisions, okay, and that makes a big difference because we're willing to sh sacrifice the short term for the longer term. And you can't always do that if someone's breathing over your shoulder. So that's, that's part of the question. Yes. Mike can answer your question. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. So Dory, Dory hit on something uh, that I think is one of the big success failure factors that don't get played up very much in small business startups, and that's the can I deal with financial insecurity? Right. Uh, because there is no way when you start your business, and maybe for 20 years, you may be every day you know, wondering whether you're going to be able to make the payroll, whether you're going to be able to buy the material, whether you're going to be able to pay for the material if you know, you've got 30 or 60 day terms. Uh, are you going to be able to pay for that building that you just built? And, <laughs> and what is your what do your family think about all that? Are they supported? Can they live with that kind of financial insecurity? Um, and you can read all the books you want. You can 
think about the wonders of entrepreneurship, but the hard truth is that every day you've got to be willing to step up and make decisions that may send you immediately to the poorhouse and your family's got to be supportive of it. Yeah, I mean, my children drive newer cars than I do. I don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you look, and my employees, I don't mind riding in their little Jaguar. You know, I'll go for you. <laughs> go, girl. I mean, she went on a vacation. I had the bookkeeper, her and her husband, and she, she wanted one. She wanted one all her life, and she got, she got halfway back from Georgia, and it quit. And I said, a Ford would have got you all the way back. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to align your priorities. You need to be realistic. And you have to be concerned for that very reason. Because it could take one bad decision. You have to have uh, enough resources lined up to be able to cover you, carry you through it. Because it's not just about you. It's about your people. I've got 45 to 50 livelihoods that have children and that are going to college or Absolutely. children at home. And I look at them like they were my own. And if I fail them by not making a good, sound financial decision, they all suffer. I've been at the government's door to take the check with an hour and a half to get it in the bank so you can cover your payroll and you go through all of that. They make hair dye for a reason, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it really goes back to what I said again about establishing a relationship with banks and bankers. Don't wait to the last moment. Just try to get something in place. How often do you all look at your business plan? In many ways, I look at parts of it almost every day, not necessarily the formal one. There are pieces of it. I don't know how often I go put it out and look at it. We have an annual uh, strategic review where I invite all of the leadership in the company in, and we sit down and we formally go through that. <coughs> what we've set up as goals for this year, what we accomplished, what we're going to do next year, but it's a dynamic process in between that, too. So. We look at it quite often, mainly because um, my business partner and I, he's the um, CFO of the company. He's got hanging on to the dollars on government spending. And so we look at it quite often. We have meetings weekly. And in that, our, our uh, exit plan, which you all have to come to terms with, too. I yeah, mean, I don't want to be 90 plan. still sitting yeah. where I'm at. I'm like, you know. And so our uh, contingency is that, you know, we have brought his son, has an interest in the business and my youngest daughter has come in. And so, you know, you have to bring them up to, to speed on that and how to look at it and why we're successful and how we got there. And But what they bring to the table is new ideas and new opportunities and, and a different way of looking at things. So I'd say we look at our business plan, I would say, you know, quite often because to see if we've made it there and if we've allotted enough time what we should do or what we should do different. You know, do we need to talk to our banker? Do we need to talk to our CPA? Is there a better way to get there? Like I said, I can't say it enough. Get involved in your city. And you're absolutely right. Give back. A lot of what you mentioned kind of has to do with things from an organizational standpoint, you know, the infrastructure and, and having good people. Um, my question would be for, for those of us who may, you know, operate as the only person in the company or, you know, act in that capacity, what what can you do on an individual level to really achieve success and, and growth and you know, continue to do well? Let me just, just tell you how I did my organizational piece when I first started, is that I hired a lot of part-timers. I had friends who were established. My first CFO worked for me a couple hours a week, you know, so you kind of reach out to different people, uh, peers. There are lots of folks out here who will help you build that infrastructure. So that was one of the tactics that I used, and, and it really helped immensely. I suggest, I, I take every, I take one day a week off. I, I, I just turn my phone off, my children know where I'm at. Because if you're so focused on what you do every day, you don't get the, you can't get a, a different perspective on it if you're that connected all the time. So I'd say, you know, give yourself some time, step back, enjoy your family, take a picnic and go to the park because you come back with a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So if you found your niche and you're passionate about what it is that you do, um, how do you get comfortable with a price point um, that 
you 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 put the value on it, but that um, you feel like other people might either say it's too high or too like that's what I'm struggling with. You you have to really test that. That's tough. Okay. On the commercial product that we have, okay, we we've gone out, we do a lot of Google searches and find out who's doing what to whom, and constantly go to potential customers and get feedback and adjust. But pricing is is tough. Okay. It's based on the market and what the competitors are doing. So. Right. Okay. If you're a little bit higher, why are you higher? What are you bringing to your table that your competitors not? Right. Okay. And be prepared to back off if you are too hot. Uh -huh. Stay there too long. Just yes. Back into it. Right.